Now on Sports Center at 6, heading into their showdown tonight, the Rockets are consumed with how they can beat the Warriors. Should the Warriors be reciprocating that obsession? Josh Rosen and Sam Donald declare for the NFL draft. Do you trust Cleveland to make the right choice? Plus, after his fifth straight double double, Steph Curry called Trey Young unbelievable. The Oklahoma freshman sensation live in minutes. Here's Michael Smith and Jamel Hill. All right, welcome to the six where we don't believe in taking snow days here. Well, we couldn't do it if we wanted to, but that's not the point. What is the point is we have lots of good stuff for you coming up today. LaShawn McCoy, he'll update us on his health status for the Bills playoff matchup with the Jags this weekend. Plus, we already told you we have baller Oklahoma baller, rather Trey Young, on today's show. But we also have Grambling State's Shakila Hill, who made history last night. But let's start with some NBA ballers who play tonight. All right, like last night's much-anticipated Cavs-Celtics matchup, tonight's Warriors-Rockets game will not be a matchup of teams at full strength. Kevin Durant is out against Houston, and after injuring his calf and last night's game against Dallas, uh, even though Durant played through it. On the plus side, Andre Iguodala will play after sitting out against the Mavs with a lower back strain. Still, for those scoring at home, no KD, no James Harden, who has been out with a hamstring injury. Now, Ramona Shelburne, however... He's always 100%. Ramona with a star player on both sides missing in a game. Everybody really wanted to see what exactly are we supposed to learn about these uh, two teams tonight. Well, look, you know, both teams are going to be down one of their main guys. Obviously, James Harden does everything for the Rockets. But when Chris Paul is on the floor, they are pretty darn good even without James Harden out there. They have that net rating. Okay, our stats guru, Micah Adams, always looks up these stats. Okay, with it, when Chris Paul is on the floor without James Harden, their net rating is is 23, okay, plus 23. When James Harden's on the floor without Chris Paul, it's plus 6. Okay, same thing for Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. When Steph Curry is on the floor without Kevin Durant, their net rating is almost 20. When Kevin Durant's on the floor without Steph Curry, it's 6, plus 6. So you look at both those two guys, the two guys are missing. I'm not going to say they're better without them, okay? You never say that. But without those are the two guys that, you know, in terms of what they do, they can compensate. And I talked to Eric Gordon, who's now starting for the Rockets in place of James Harden. He said, you know, James Harden is always in attack mode. Now we all have to be in attack mode. All right. Well, thanks for the info, uh, Ramona. We appreciate it. And for giving us many reasons to watch tonight's game. She attacked that live shot. Not exactly the way to make an impression on a potential future teammate. Getting beat by 37 times for the second worst home loss in franchise history. And worse, having Kyle Kuzma call your team out for quitting. Meanwhile, Paul George's 24-point night was so nice and easy. So not only did he get to show love to his parents' courtside, as you just saw, between a possession, even had opportunities to glance up and admire newly hung numbers 8 and 24. No wonder PG seems to realize going home might not be all it's cracked up to be. What was it like playing on this court tonight? It's always special. It's always special. Every chance I got, I glanced at, uh, you know, Kobe's retirement numbers. Um, it's, it's just a special place. It's always going to be a special place. Uh, regardless if I'm in a Laker jersey or not, it's always going to be a special place to me. Um, but with that being said, I'm still happy where I'm at. We're getting wins. Um, we're playing great basketball. We're going forward. Woj, uh, he also said earlier that he'd be stupid to leave if the Thunder were on an upper trajectory to leave for L.A. So we're sick of guessing. We figured we'd go to somebody who's in the know. <laughs> Is he just saying the right things, but really his heart's already in L.A. and he'll find a reason to fall in love with L.A. when, it, when the summer comes? Oklahoma City knew when they traded for Paul George that they were going to be coming from behind. The only chance they had to get Paul George was to get him in there for a year, sell him on the environment, the team he was there, and and have a chance to win. And so Oklahoma City knows that their best chance to keep him from L.A. is to make a deep playoff run, is to find a chemistry there with Russell Westbrook, you know, with Carmelo by extension, and convince him that this is his best chance to win. Because L.A. is does it is home. He grew up a Lakers fan. Every great player in the league, many great players dream of playing in L.A. He grew up around it. They're still coming from behind on it, but they knew that when they traded for him. Yeah, so when you say deep playoff run, he says it's not championship or bust. But we're talking conference finals, a, a hard-fought series against the Warriors. So, like, how deep they got to yeah, go for and, him and, to say, and, I'm not going home to a team that maybe has potential or not? The, he, for him to stay in Oklahoma City, I think there's got to be a sense that they they have or can close the gap on Golden State, on 
Houston on San Antonio, that they have a trajectory here to win big. Uh, they'll get to the trade deadline in February, and I think there'll be a point where Sam Presti, the GM, will go to Aaron Mintz, his agent, go to Paul, and kind of say, where is your head right now? And I think they're going to keep going forward with this group, barring catastrophe. If the thing just didn't go well at yeah. all, if they never righted it, um, yeah, there could have been a chance that they move Paul George. Right now, he's still holding up the trade market. There are teams waiting to see how did the Thunder play in the next month. Does Paul George become available? Because there's still teams who'd go after him, but teams know how much would – even Oklahoma City knows this. How much are we going to get for Paul George if everybody in the league thinks he's going to L.A. in free agency anyway? What is he worth as a rental? And the answer may be our best play in Oklahoma City – is to still try to make a run at this, make one run at this with this group together and see what happens. How guys feel now, how they feel next month, it can all change with a deep playoff run. I know he loves L.A. and wants to be a part of that legacy, but I'm sorry. They're too far away. If I'm him and I'm trying to win, they're way too far away unless you know you got somebody coming with you. Well, but then here's the thing. If you're going to lose – then lose in the playoffs. Lose play. at home. Lose at home. I mean, essentially. <laughs> that's that's right? one way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I know it's maybe Lose not, comfortably. Yeah, it may not be the best logic, but if he's, if he's not that far, as what we said, if he's already – uh, further away from beating Golden State in Oklahoma City, you you could do that in LA. The at the crib. <laughs> That's what we're looking at. The one thing in LA though is always you come in this year and then next year, you know Kawhi Leonard, whoever the next big free agents sure. are, mm-hmm. it takes one guy to come in. It's easier to come when a really great player has already said yeah. yes. And you look at it as a, and they have some good young players. There's reasons to say yes, but they got a long, they got a lot of growth to do. Absolutely. How much time does he have in his prime is a thing. Absolutely. Good to talk to you, man. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you for the information. It. Friday, 7 Eastern, Timberwolves, Celtics, and then Wizards, Grizzlies. A couple of running back injury report updates heading into uh, Wild Card Weekend. DeMarco Murray ruled out for a second straight game with knee injury. Uh, Derrick Henry will try to start against the Chiefs uh, and try not to be soft again. His words, not mine. A bigger concern might be whether Marcus Mariota can overcome coaching. Delaney Walker's words, not mine. Just means Mariota needs to know when to follow those backyard football instincts when the play breaks down. You feel me? Yeah, way to break that down. Now along those same lines, Bills running back Michelle McCoy's status for Sunday's wild card game against the Jags is a game time decision after he suffered a nasty ankle injury against Miami and Buffalo's final, final regular season game. But for what it's worth, McCoy provided some hopeful news for Bills fans today. I just want to be able to cut uh, well enough where I don't feel I don't have a lot of pain in cutting. Um, I just want to be close, you know, the best as far as 100 percent as I can get. Uh, but the type of game like this, man, you gotta lay on the line. If I can't get 100 percent as I'm out there, and I can run effectively enough. You know, I'll do it. So we'll just see. Now, just to give you an idea how important McCoy is to the Bills' offense, consider that McCoy had nearly 1,600 yards from scrimmage this season, over 1,000 more than any of his teammates. He accounted for 33% of the team's scrimmage yards, the second-highest rate in the league behind Ty Gurley. The Bills' depth chart behind Shady is kind of shaky. 32-year-old Mike Tolbert, a converted fullback, and Marcus Murphy, who has eight carries, seven of which came in Week 17. That's a beautiful graphic. And speaking of beautiful, shout-out to Leonard Fournette getting his offensive lineman Rolexes. Whoa. How about that? Way to go, Rookie. Boy. Very classy. All right. And in case you forgot, we'll remind you at least a thousand times the NFL playoffs start on ESPN and ABC Saturday. Titans at Chiefs, 420 p.m. Eastern. Be there. All right. Let's keep this party going, shall we? Without further ado, best college basketball player in the country, Steph Curry's new favorite player. Your favorite player's favorite player. About to join us on the show, Trey Young. Just the confidence that he plays with. Uh, I call it the flair, but he just he's always seems like he's always composed and knows what he's trying to do every time he has the ball in his hand. He does, you know, he shoots a lot of deep threes and has a creativity to his game. It's, it's, it's just so fluid to watch. The, the comparisons are what they are, and uh, I, I know when I, you turn on the game and you watch them play, you, you, know, you, you just watching him you know, on the floor where he is at all times. But that kind of uh, magnetism is pretty, pretty special. 
See, Steph fit the game winner against the Mavs last night and said, hey, can I come on the show? He's like, nah, we, we, no. we got Trey Young. We got Trey Young today. <laughs> That's who's on the six. Not every day, Trey, that a league MVP, uh, a two-time NBA champion, that he gives you that kind of praise. So what did it mean to you to hear Steph Curry speak that highly of you in your game? Oh, it, it means a lot. I mean, it means a lot. Um, coming from someone who I, I looked up to, uh, I mean, growing up, watched a lot of film over his game. I love his game. Uh, I'm just a big fan of his. But, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of surreal. Maybe one day uh, here in the next few years I could be playing against him. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it meant a lot, and uh, it was pretty cool. Now, see, you just made me feel old because you said I grew up watching Steph Curry. Okay. Uh, but you, as you mentioned, you studied him, you watched him, but you also watched a lot of other NBA point guards. Who have you studied and what did you learn? I mean, growing up, uh, I watched a lot of film uh, with my dad and uh, I watched a lot of Steve Nash growing up, um, just how, how cerebral he was and uh, how he could get to wherever he wanted to. I mean, to get to on the floor, and he had great touch from all three levels. Um, I mean, obviously Steph, um, but also a guy like Kyrie with his handle. Um, but I, I watch a, a lot of a lot of point guards, and um, I just pick different things from different different players. Let me put you on the spot here. Do you consider yourself a better scorer or playmaker? You lead the country in both. <laughs> uh, I, I would say I would say playmaker. Uh, I try to do everything. Um, Try to try to score and, and get everybody involved, and just try to do whatever it takes for my for my team to win. When you uh, Steph talked about um, your confidence and your flair, where that come from? Um, I, I've I've just always had confidence in myself. Uh, I, I just put in so much work and and preparation. Uh, I think that that's the ultimate key to help you have the most confidence. Um, I, I just I just work so hard and. Uh, I give a lot of credit to, to Coach Kruger, and um, I mean he, he instills confidence in not only me but my whole team, and uh, I, I think I mean, he does a great job in doing that. And but I've always had confidence growing up. So you watched a lot of drills on YouTube. Uh, you would uh, record games for Steph Curry's and watch them that night or the next day. I wonder at what point did you watch Steph and the way he played the game and really changed the game? At what point did you watch him? and say, you know what, that's me. Because you weren't always a point guard. You were on the wing waiting for shots, and then in eighth grade you became a point guard. So when did you first become inspired by Steph Curry? I mean, well, it's crazy because a long time ago I used to be a ball boy for the University of Oklahoma, and uh, I was actually at the game when, when he came and uh, he played Blake Griffin here. And uh, I remember watching him and Blake go at it and just, 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 just loving his game and loving how the way he played and, um, and ever since then, uh, I was probably around eight, eight or nine years old. Um, but just, just falling in love with his game, just knowing, uh, that one day hopefully I could, I could be doing what he's doing at the collegiate level. And, um, I, I, just, just when I was a kid and around nine or ten years old. Now, a lot of people are falling in love with you right now as they become more acquainted with your story. But coming into this college basketball season, people talked about Marvin Bagley III, Mo Bamba, a lot of the players, your name wasn't mentioned a whole lot. So what kind of motivation does that give you? Does it make you feel an extra chip on your shoulder? I mean, coming out of high school, uh, I mean, we, we, we're all good friends. Uh, I mean, Mo, like you said, I mean, all those guys you just named, I mean, they're, we're all pretty close. Um, I, I didn't necessarily use that as motivation. Uh, I always try to find a little bit of a uh, motivation within myself, and uh, I always set certain goals here and there, um, and then use that as my motivation. Uh, but I knew uh, coming out of high school and, and entering college that winning was going to take care of everything. Um, I knew my uh, I knew numbers were going to be there just by the way I played and the way our offenses ran and, and everything like that. But I knew. Uh, as long as we won, that was going to take care of everything else. And so far we're doing that, um, but we're in a tough conference, and i got to continue to do that. Nobody's sleeping on you anymore, that's for sure. And, you know, you obviously you had to break out of the PK-80, and you're putting up these crazy historic numbers just 13 games in. So now you got teams, you know, game planning for you, uh, you know, obviously trying to, to make life difficult for you now that you're in the conference play, more pressure on you, presumably, or not. How are you handling the uh, the increased intensity of the spotlight and deservedly so that spotlight. Um, like I said, I, I knew winning was going to take care of everything. I knew this was going to happen if, if we won. 
but being in, in such a tough conference, you just got to take it one game at a time. Um, and, and that's one thing my dad and, and Coach Kruger uh, harped on with me and uh, coming into the season is just taking it one game at a time. Uh, I think that's why I, me and my team have been able to have the success we've had uh, was just because uh, we're, we're, we're dialed in and focused on that next game. Um, not not looking forward to the two or three games uh, later, just that next next game and taking it one game at a time and just, just focusing on that. I'm wondering if your uh, good buddy Baker Mayfield, if he gave you some advice about how to handle being the big man on campus and, for that matter, this kind of spotlight. Well, I mean, Baker's ba- definitely one of my good friends. Um, I mean, he, he had a great year. Uh, <laughs> Great career here. Um, sad to, to see it end short, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we talk. We don't. We don't necessarily talk a lot about sports. Uh, we, we get enough of that, um, but we, we we just we like talking and hanging out uh, and, and doing things like that. Well, hey man, we enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for the time uh, and appreciate the entertainment. You've been fun to watch. Only 13 games in. Can't wait to see what you got next. Maybe you can have a quadruple double. <laughs> like we having a quadruple double. Now, <laughs> That would, be, that would be tough. That would be tough. But I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, All right, thank, thank you, man. you We got Sha'Cala Hill coming up later. Thank you, bro. All right, uh, the college football playoff national championship game, not only an all-SEC affair, but a family affair. You see Alabama junior wide receiver Calvin Ridley's younger brother, Riley Ridley, is a sophomore wideout for the Bulldogs. Calvin said he's not talking to Riley, though, this week, since it's all business. Marty Smith caught up with the Tide's top pass catcher and got inside the sibling rivalry within the rivalry. Alabama wide receiver Calvin Ridley is regarded by many as the best wideout in the country. Every single year he's been at Alabama, he's played in the national championship game. This year's no different. Maybe a little different. This year, he'll play against his little brother, Riley. What conversations will there be this week between you two? We actually haven't even, he haven't sent me a text, I haven't sent him a text. I, I'm going to wait for him to send one before I send one. <laughs> so if we, if we don't talk, we don't. That's my brother. And, you know, we talk all the time. You know, I tell him what he's doing wrong. He tells me. And uh, we look out for each other. So if he don't hit me up, I ain't hitting him up. One of the big question marks for Alabama entering the Sugar Bowl against Clemson was could they stretch the field? Would they be able to go vertical against a really good Tigers defense? Ultimately, they did. Ridley was a major reason why. When I chatted with him Thursday, I asked him, how important is it for you to have that same impact in the national championship? He said, it's very important. The reason, it opens up the offense for everybody else. All right, and now from the Georgia side, Coley Harvey joins us from campus in Athens. Now, how are the Bulldogs, uh, Coley, getting set on the eve of their arrival to Atlanta? Yeah, well, Jamel, some of that preparation involves rest. Uh, Earlier this week, Kirby Smart talking about that long flight back home from Los Angeles and how, you know, it had some of the players and even coaches a little bit jet lagged as they tried to get their bodies back acclimated to the Eastern time zone. Also, as far as the preparation, they were actually peeking ahead to Alabama and also Clemson just in case before the Rose Bowl. They had to get ahead because this is indeed a short week. Now, as far as how the Bulldogs are approaching the game, let's uh, take a listen to Terry Godwin on how he's coming into this ball game itself. I'm not going to treat it like anything else, like anything special. I mean, it's a big game, but we're going to treat it like any other game during the season. What would this mean for the entire state of Georgia to finally make this happen, possibly the first time since 1980? I mean, it'll mean a lot just to them and also to us and his coaching staff because, I mean, we put in a lot of hard work throughout the season and before the season, and for us to be able to come out and reward ourselves and also these seniors that decided to come back, I mean, it's a special thing that's, that's going to keep going on around here. Now, before uh, before you heard from Terry there, I did mention the rest being a big issue for the Bulldogs. I do have to say that I've been around the uh, the campus here the last couple of days, and today you do see a little bit of a better life in the uh, in the eyes of the players and the coaches when you walk around the facility here. People at least seem like they're starting to get some of that rest that Kirby Smart has been preaching about all week. All right, thank you, Coley. Appreciate you. All right, so if you've been watching ESPN today, you know today marks the third anniversary of the passing of our dear friend Stuart Scott. Now, certainly our hearts are heavy because we miss our friend, but we can all smile today because we remember all the times that Stuart made us laugh. Game time, baby. Yo, game time. You got that LeBron thing going on? It's going to be a great show. A great show. A little bit of uh, pop and lock. Booyah. Ha. Who knows?
You're the man. I'm the man. I'm the man. Come I'm on, the man. gotta be like, I'm the man. I'm the man. <laughs> Not a rookie anymore. I shouldn't be doing all of this. Wait, I thought you were rookie of the year. Right. Right. Rookie of the year. You gotta wear that thing all week. Yeah. Good luck out there. Hey guys, you're on about 60 clicks. All right, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, Tiger. Those uh, two. You want to sponsor me in that Bristol Road race? No. Chosen one, huh? You ready to do this? Let's do it. I don't know who we are, what we can be until we get IT back, you know, and consistently. You know, but we know what the we know what the program is, so it's not like a surprise he wasn't playing tonight. We already knew that he probably he won't play in the Indiana game after we've been in Minnesota. He's not playing back to backs right now. So, you know, until we, you know, get a full dosage of uh, of IT and get our rotations down and things of that nature, you know, we we'd be fine. Got to be careful talking about statement games and takeaways from games in January. That's it. How big is a deal was that blowout loss in Boston? Well, um, I guess it depends on whose perspective you choose to look at the game from. I think for the Celtics, it, it, it wasn't – got to be careful about how I frame big deal because there are degrees of a big deal. But I think it was a significant game for them. It clearly wasn't for the Cavs because I think if you watched it, you saw that, you know, maybe they didn't bring their full energy into that Which game. Which is typical for them this time of year. It, it is. Yeah. I mean, they look like a team that – you know, we've been to the finals. We've experienced right. some things. We've won a title. Like they look like they're figuring it out. In fairness, correct. Yeah. Yes, and I, I don't mean to suggest that they went in there and didn't take the Celtics seriously. Right. It just was only going to mean so much. But I think for Boston, especially that this wasn't the team they thought that they would have. Every time that they're able to beat the Cavs, I think it gives them a little more confidence. So uh, the big line from LeBron today has been, "We don't know who we are," and none of us know who they are because we haven't seen them at full strength yet. I'll tell you what I know that they aren't, which is young. They're old. Yeah. I saw a young team, a hungry, energetic, feisty, just hungry. Just, I said hungry already. They, 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 they're hungry. H O, yeah. yeah. The, the Celtics, hungry. whether it's Rozier, <laughs> whether it's Brown, whether yeah. it's Tatum. And you always say, well, LeBron's been there, done that. We've seen this movie before. Don't dare write off LeBron. Or the Celtics haven't. This group, they're young. They haven't been there, done that. I'm sorry. The way they defend you don't just figure out how to defend on that level. Right. That's something that builds throughout the season. I don't see the Cavs flipping that particular switch against this particular Celtics team with Kyrie scoring 11 points. They're just, I'm not here right now because I don't have to. I'm not predicting the Celtics will win the East. What I'm saying is Isaiah Thomas is not their answer on defense. That's more firepower, right. certainly. And that will help when you're, when you're not transitioning on defense as much. Maybe you're taking the ball out of the basket more than the other team is. I get all of that. But what I'm saying is that Celtics team is not just some cute story. And I don't know that the Cavs have the answers to match what the Celtics bring when it comes to their depth, the way they share the ball, the way they move the ball, and again, the way they defend. 88 points? Yeah. Even without Isaiah Thomas, 88 points? It's pretty special. You, they often say this in our business that you can sometimes see your replacement coming through the door. And when I see the Celtics... Ain't, well, <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry, right. sorry, Mike. You know, we, we know you on a different level. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but no, but sometimes you can <laughs> right. see it. And with the Celtics, even though I don't think it will be this year, but you think about when they get Gordon Hayward back and another year playing together. You also don't always see it coming. 
Yeah, that's on true. On the outside. That's true. Sometimes that changing of the guard happens overnight. Mm. All right. Uh, so last night, both Josh Rosen and Sam Darnold made it official and declared for the NFL draft, joining fellow blue chip prospects Baker Mayfield and Josh Allen. Also yesterday, Jets general manager Mike McCagnan, uh, he said that New York would be willing to trade up for the six, from the sixth spot if they identify one of those guys as the guy. Uh-oh. Be interesting to see if they can find a willing partner, though, Jamel, with the exception of the Colts. We think every other team in the top five needs a QB. Browns have picks one and four, and I have joked the other day, they should take a QB with both picks. <laughs> Give them a better chance of finally getting it right. You know what? That's actually not Think crazy. about it. Think about it. If they take crazy. one, 99% chance they blow it. Okay. If they take two, right. you know, Washington did it with RG3 and Kirk Cousins in the fourth round. They, you know, worked on one end. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. the Browns, they mess them both up. They figure they out a way. They passed so many times, and they've ruined it for other teams thinking about passing. So, anyway, what do you think of these two quarterbacks so, in particular? So, we're already quarterback. here at the great quarterback debate, yeah. right? Because uh, we always got to center in on two guys and then – have that this one's going to be a bust this one isn't and they may they're not the only two so they no. may not be the top two no. i mean kyper and mcshay have them as a top two but no. they may not be the two there's allen and mayfield and look I, I like both these guys for different reasons but i also dislike them both for a variety of reasons i tell you what doesn't matter to me is is josh rosen's attitude and that that has come up a lot in these draft talks i expect any moment that anonymous gm to drop some shade on him and yeah. say well, you know there's already reports coming out they don't like his attitude because he uh is in football to make money I'm sorry. I, I thought that was what you were supposed to do. Yeah. Sam Darno, obviously, the turnovers yeah. are a problem, and he looked like. Only as funky as your last cut. Thank you. And and he was funky. And he was. Not and a good way. When you consider the fact that he came in as the Heisman favorite and to have a season that was a little bit more up and down for somebody of his caliber. And, and even with Rosen, he's been really inconsistent, too. So I think as what tends to happen this time of the year, you're going to have a lot of reasons to pick them apart, a lot of reasons to want to talk yourself into mm-hmm. going with them. That's what's going to happen. It's just a matter, I think, for these guys, maybe. I can't say more so than any other year, but I think situation is going to be super important. That's what's going to happen because the desperation is going to outweigh the doubt at this point. All right. If you're Cleveland, you can't keep passing. You've done that way too much. You can't keep passing a quarterback. True. If you're the Giants, true. and especially if your boy Rosen is true, it's true that he's making a power play, doesn't want to go to the Browns and wants to supplant Eli by pulling an Eli. If you're the Giants, you can't afford to pass on a quarterback if you think he might be the guy. If you got a, a piece of a quarterback up there, you say, we'll take him and we'll nurture him. We'll get him right. The Broncos, can, you, can, can John Elway continue to waste that defense? And, and, and pass on a quarterback. So what I'm saying is, is that nobody knows anything when it comes to these quarterbacks, especially the people doing the decision making. Because when you think somebody, oh, they got a lot of question and warts about him, and is he really the guy? It turned out to be Jared Goff. Right. Or somebody else goes up and gets Carson Wentz. Or you saw Cleveland get cute last week, or last year, excuse me, with Deshaun Watson. Mm-hmm. So I think these guys right now, the situation is obviously going to matter the most. But if you think a guy has a chance you got to go get him. You can't overthink it and think, well, I don't like the turnovers he had in college. Matt Ryan threw 19 picks last year right. at Boston College. We've seen guys have turnovers before and be better in the NFL. Well, I'll tell you, my favorite quarterback in the draft. Who was that? Baker? Baker. It's Baker. Also, I think, I think you should be Good there. attitude. I got you. Uh, so, adjust your lineups accordingly. Kevin Durant is out against the Rockets tonight, which the Warriors announced today. James Harden already has been out with a hamstring injury. So, maybe this isn't as significant of a matchup for us, but don't tell that to the Rockets, who have made it known they're obsessed with the Warriors. And you know what the Warriors think of that? Not a damn thing. Yeah, just saying the obvious. <laughs> Which you could read more about in Chris Haynes' piece today it, on ESPN.com. Why should the Rockets being obsessed with the Warriors is saying, hey, we want to win. <laughs> That's what they're saying. We want to win. We got to beat the Warriors in order to win. You're right. And, and why should the Warriors be worried about the Rockets? Well, listen to what Draymond says about it. He said every team's a threat. Exactly. You can lose to anybody. So what are we talking about? My viewpoint as far as them making moves for us, I respect that the goal is to win a championship. And if you're not trying to win a championship, then what are you doing it for? So I respect that they're trying to make moves, being that we're the defending champions. But I'm not going to go into game 39 of the season talking about we got to beat the Houston Rockets because they made moves to beat us. It's just another game, and we'll try to get better like we do every game. Great. A lot of truth spoken there. But guess what? We're bringing in Chris Haynes yeah, anyway hey, we, to we, talk about it. We're bringing in Chris Haynes. Great job, Chris Haynes. Great article. That, awesome stuff. <laughs> okay. You just want to thank him for it. Yeah, exactly. See, Chris, it's a An awesome suit. I want to I'll see a suit. <laughs> it's of my opinion, Chris, that even though I believe Draymond is right, it's game 39, they're not going to get worked up about anything necessarily. But yet and still, knowing that this team is, quote, obsessed with them, knowing that they're coming for them, are, is it a, in a game like this, if you're the Warriors, do you try to send a little bit of a message? 
Well, I, I think you do, Jamil and Micah. And look, they're, they're all competitors. And I think Kevin Durant, in, in the same article, you know, he came out and said, look, it should be fun. We, we welcome the challenge. We welcome that they're trying to get up to our level and they've made moves to try to come back what we've been able to do over the last three years. Now, I will say this. Now, I, I, I kind of went into the story knowing that they were going to go and try to downplay the significance of what the Rockets have done and, and what they're trying to do. But it's, it's clear that the Golden State Warriors feel that they are a threat. You know, when they, after games, they, they look, they're looking at the Rocket scores. They're looking at some of the top teams. Kevin Durant said OKC is one of those teams as well that they're looking at. So they wanted to make sure they didn't single out the Rockets. But I think for me covering these guys, it's clear that they're at least on their radar. Well, they'd be foolish to right. ignore them, they're right? They're good. <laughs> okay, they're, they're really good. You know what else is good? That suit your, game. I'm going to say you wore your Bruh. Easter Sunday suit. Here on a Thursday. That's how you do it, Chris Hayes. To to deliver a sermon. All right. We'll we'll catch you later. Okay. I just want to know, who has Grambling State's Shekyla Hill on their fantasy team? Because last night, the junior guard messed around and dropped a quadruple double. 15 points, 10 assists, 10 rebounds, and 10 steals in a win over Alabama State. She's just the fourth player in D1 women's basketball history to account for a quadruple double. That's insane. Now to put this further in historical context, she posted the ninth official quadruple double between college and professional American basketball and the first since Lester Hudson did it for Tennessee Martins men's team in November 2007. And now my cousin, yes, I'm claiming Claimer. her as my cousin, Shekyla Hill joins us right here on The Six. Now, Shekyla, you completed your quadruple double in the closing seconds by recording your 10th assist on Monisha Neal's three-pointer. Now, what would you have done? What would you have said to her if she would have missed that shot? Um, I don't think I would have been too upset, but I think kind of like on the inside in my mind, I would have been really mad at her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you because you were down in history. I-, I know you've had a lot of interesting and cool moments, a lot of people shouting you out on Twitter, a lot of recognition of your achievement. So tell us, what was the coolest moment that you've had in the last 24 hours? Um, the coolest moment probably is my Instagram followers. I went from 8,000 followers to 20,000 followers what? in less than like 24 hours. So I think that's pretty big. That is huge. That is huge, y'all. You know what? Hit, hit off with that follow, okay? Since y'all Yeah, yeah, now. I got you now. <laughs> Jimmy, I'll mention the social media uh, love you were getting. James Harden, Chris Paul taking notice of your night last night. What you, would you feel when you saw that? Um, at first, I saw the James Harden one, and I was already emotional. But then when I saw Chris Paul, I really broke down. But I'm still waiting on LeBron to tweet me or call me. I'm still waiting on that. Get at her, LeBron. <laughs> get at her. Because let me tell you, a lot of Twitter producers were hitting us both up, saying, y'all had better get Shakala on the 6th tomorrow. So here you are. Whether we want it or not, you were going to be on this show. The people demanded it. So you guys play Southern on Saturday. Would it be too much to ask for, I don't know, another quadruple double? Um, no, I don't think it would be too much to ask. I mean, I feel that pressure already, but I feel like God prepared me for this moment and whatever else he has in store, I'm ready for. I love it. And a quadruple double against Southern, that would be even sweeter. I know. I'm going to start calling you quad. Is that okay? For sure. Can we call you quad? Yes, okay. All right, cool. (laughs) (laughs) Well, look, uh, Shakila, I know it's been a busy day for you on campus. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. And keep it up. And who knows, maybe you'll have more moments where you can come back. And I'm sure now that LeBron has heard it, he'll give you that shout out or that call that you richly deserve. Thank you so much. All right. Shout her out, Bron. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jackson Bills fans, a little bit of back and forth on Twitter ahead of that uh, AFC wildcard showdown. Jags like, we got tickets left. Bills like, fake news. Um, I'm pulling. Jags, Jags fans don't want any from this group. For Bills Mafia? No. The X fans a little man. They got a little edge to them too now. I, I, let's go on the field. Okay. I'm pulling for the Jazz. I'm tired. I'm tired of people talking trash about Jake about Blake Bortles. So you were about to get his name wrong. I just let you know that's sign of disrespect. No, actually, I was about to cuss, <laughs> and then it kind of messed me up after that. When I said talking trash, I was oh, saying, that's what happened. Yeah. The Jazz Titans talking about Blake Bortles when they got to deal with the Chiefs. Everybody deal with uh, this bomb cyclone. What is that? Where did that come from? Uh, Bill Belichick yeah. told the Patriots, be there early or don't show up. He sent people home, getting there late. So Dominic Foxworth was on Dan Levertard earlier, and he told a story um, or they, about how a lot of coaches do this. And yeah. I guess he did this for Randy Moss, Belichick did. 
He sent him home. Sounds familiar. Yeah, because he was late during a snowstorm. Yeah, you were yeah. late today, but I was you're still here. Yeah, but technically, I'm late. I had no problem. You know, I'm right around the corner. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, you live ten minutes away. I got the perfect car for it. Uh, Nikola Miritich, yo. This is... That's nasty. Yeah. Jelly and mayo? Yeah, but it's not as bad <laughs> as this earlier on Levitard. Oh, no. No, no. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> this was so real. There's actual vomit on the floor over there. Hey, Piper. I don't want that. Mayonnaise is nasty. Paper? I need to wash Stop it. Stop lying to yourself. You eat potato salad? I do. Potato salad has mayonnaise in it. That's different, though. Mm. Mm. Why are you so nasty? That's what I want to know. Mm. You got a lot of great qualities. One of them, you like, you're, you're literally the, the nastiest person in the world when it comes to your palate. Mm-hmm. To be such a foodie, a wine person, mm-hmm. all that. We need some hot sauce with this. They have so much fun on Levitar. It must be nice. <laughs> uh, who's not having fun? Chris Stapp Porzingis. Struggled last night against the Wizards, 16 on 5 of 13. He said, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, t- I'm tired. I'm so, so tired. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> weary. Back to back games. I'm tired. I'm, I'm so tired right now. Um, I have one day now to, to rest my legs and then, um, and then, and then get back and, 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 and play better and have more energy. Mental part doesn't help at all, you know. But it's mentally tough, you know, you just don't have any. Did you follow that paper? I did. Okay. okay. Uh, it's the real predictable, easy, low hanging fruit thing. Oh, because I'm crying. Stop crying about being tired. They never get tired back in the day. This is New York. But you you want to be the face of the franchise? Be careful it's what you wish for. It's understandable why he feels that way. You can't say right. it. Right. You cannot say it. Well, no, nobody you has to care. But he was being honest. He's like, this is Tim Hardaway. Maybe Jeff Horner said he'll do a better job of getting him, I, taking the pressure off. I get why he is, but you just can't say that. Can't show that weakness? No, you can't. You. Not in New York anyway. Yeah, uh, so veteran ref Teddy Valentine had a very disrespectful reaction, in my opinion, to Joel Berry uh, when he tried to discuss a nine call. Sure. Not the first time TV Teddy has been involved in a controversial uh, situation. It's immature. Like, yeah. you have the technical foul at your disposal. Correct. You don't have to turn your back to him. You can say, hey, man, fall back. And they get on players all the time about how they interact with officials. And here you have an official, a longtime official, who yeah. should know better. Well, and now the ACC is looking into it, right? Yes, they are looking into it. I would say it. he's watching too many NBA officials, except to your point, he has a body of work to this effect, right? Right. Yeah, now even though we don't have the video here, he was also on the court when Bobby Knight threw the chair. That was him. So. All right. All right, got Greg Marshall, Wichita State, ninth ranked Wichita State. Will they shock Houston? No, they can't because they're the higher ranked team. What am I talking about? Sam, I blame you for that. Way to make me sound corny. Sound? Here's Paul Pierce. <laughs> Listen, on February 11th, the night I get my jersey retirement, I'm not sure I want to look up at the jumble trying to see Isaiah highlights. Bro, you uh, after all the years I put in. You don't need to share that with nobody. You know, I had a chance to watch Kobe's and throughout the game, the timeouts, it was a lot of tribute videos for him, and I enjoyed to watch that throughout the game. Now, hopefully, you know, the Boston Celtics will do that for me. I'm not sure if I want to see an Isaiah video that night. Chill, Paul, because the truth, here's the truth. No, here's the truth. You saw it last night. Celtics fans, that organization, they know how to handle showing love and respect and saluting their stars. There's plenty of time for them to do both. Trust me. Trust me. I get where he's coming from, but it'll be a moot point. The video will be hidden. He'll have his night. Trust me. Um, All-star early returns. Milwaukee Bucks' Giannis Antetokounmpo made his debut last season. He's the leading vote-getter in the first fan re- returns of NBA All-Star voting 2018 presented by Verizon. He is. But as long as Embiid is in, I'm good. Okay. Well, that's okay. great, though, that uh, he's the leading vote-getter. Yeah, be LeBron not too far behind. I hope DeRozan starts, too. DeRozan and Ola Depot mm-hmm. get some too. So coming up tonight, 11 p.m. Eastern on Sports Center, Linda Cohn and Kenny Maine. They'll react to the Warriors-Rockets showdown. I hope they talk about Gerald Green. From the couch, Houstonian, 27 points against the Magic. Great story. LeVar and family in Lithuania and Nick Saban's news conference approach to Mel, which you know plenty about, which is not say much of anything and complain, but we love it. All right, before we call the day, who had a good day? Okay, so former NFL player Aaron Maben, he's now an elementary school teacher in his hometown of Baltimore, and he's doing his part to bring attention to a unacceptable situation at his school and others around the city. He posted a video of students describing how cold it is in their classroom. Some of them in there huddled with heat, and they've started a GoFundMe page. So go 
and help them support these story. children. That's a great story. The Vegas Golden Knights, 12-0-1 in their last 13. Going for their ninth straight win when they play the Blues in St. Louis tonight. Only North okay, American um, pro sports franchise to win eight straight games at any point. Right over here. the last 40 years. <laughs> If we were, if that were another sport, we'd be leading sports center with it. Shout out to hockey people. You go, you go Talk slide. about the Golden Knights, <laughs> like man. Cedric. The Blackberry Melrose.